Just by the reading, even if you didn't know that this book was going to end at chapter 50, we can see that, it, that it's heading somewhere, that there's progress being made, and the end as, of the story as Moses is telling it here is in sight. One of the main things that, that give that away is because previous promises that were made to Abraham in the very early chapters of the book are being fulfilled. Go forth from your country, God said to Abram and from your relatives, and from your father's house, to the land I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I'll make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Blessings abound. It's the, the title for this morning, Blessings Abound. In, in the very beginning, the promises that God is making to his people, the covenant promises include blessing. I will bless you. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. In you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Genesis 12, 1 through 3, God speaking to Abram. But all of them, all of what God has promised to Abraham has not yet been fulfilled. They've not yet come to fruition. God is still at work accomplishing his perfect will. When we come to chapter 48 this morning, there's a 17-year fast forward from where we left off last week. So we got Jacob and all of his kids, his family, moved into Goshen, away from the Egyptians so that they can continue on life as God had commanded them to, separated from the other nations so that they might continue in their worship rituals not being contaminated by the world. Now, 17 years have gone by, and Jacob's life is coming to an end. I've divided these four, pardon, these two chapters into four sections that we'll look at separately this morning. The first one is the entire first chapter, chapter 48, 1 through 21, the blessing of Joseph's sons through 22 actually, 1 through 22, the blessing of Joseph's sons. Then secondly, the blessing of Leah's sons, verses 1 through 15 of chapter 49. Then the blessing of the servant's sons, that's Leah and Rachel's servants, 16 through 21. And then blessing Rachel's sons, verses 20 through, 22 through 28 of chapter 49. Blessing Joseph's sons, Genesis chapter 48. And the primary blessing is that of adoption. That's where Jacob is headed with regard to Ephraim and Manasseh, who are Joseph's sons. But the way the story begins here in the beginning of the chapter is that Jacob has to collect all of his strength. He's on his sick bed. He's dying. He collects all of the strength within him and probably has help as well to sit up in order to have a conversation with Joseph, his son. It's a remarkable act of faith here on Jacob's part. He's in his dying days. He's facing death. And he's looking to the promises of God. In fact, when the writer of Hebrews records that great chapter 11 and how faith has been displayed in so many saints who have gone on before, it's this act that we've read this morning in Genesis 48 and 49 that Jacob is remembered for. By faith, Hebrews 11:21. by faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped leaning on the top of his staff. This is the story of faith that was passed down through all of the ages. He's gathering himself together with all of his strength, sitting up to talk initially to Joseph and his sons, and then to the rest of the sons as well. The first words that he speaks to him. Verse 3, God Almighty. He's on his deathbed. He's sick, he's bedridden, he knows there's not much time, and he is determined to exclaim the omnipotence of God. 
remarkable display of faith for this old man. We have the history of his life. Oh, we've talked about that in previous weeks. He, he doesn't have that great of a track record of faith. But here we see him in the end determined to finish well. I don't know about you, but if most of us knew that we were on our deathbed, our conversation would be more about the recent medication change or the new treatment or the doctors that changed on the last shift or when I'm going to get transferred to rehab or what nursing home I'm going to go to or what hospice might look like. But not so with Jacob. Jacob has one thing on his mind, and it's, it's the omnipotence of God. He's not just reminiscing about the past and what God has done for him. Here he is on his deathbed, and he's looking forward. He's looking towards the future promises of God. He knows that God has promised, I will make you fruitful and numerous. He knows that what was lost in Eden particularly with the command, be fruitful and multiply, is found in Canaan. He realizes that they're not in Canaan, they're in Egypt right now. But there's a lot of hope and confidence in Jacob that the people of God will eventually be in Canaan and it will be given to them as an inheritance. God Almighty, he says. And then verse 5, now your two sons... They were born before I came to you, Ephraim and Manasseh. They shall be mine. Just like Reuben and Simeon. Here's a comparison. Just like the firstborn and secondborn. There, there isn't a greater comparison that Jacob could have used here to convince Joseph, this is what I mean. They are just as much of sons as the first and secondborn. They are full recipients of the inheritance. They are full recipients of the promise. They are full participants in the family. The picture here for, for Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, are wonderful. But the reality of what's being portrayed here is the adoption that we have in Christ. We have full benefits because we're in Christ. It's Christ who is our elder brother that God is saying to us, just like him, you have full benefits, full access, adoption, saved from our former father who seeks to kill, to steal, and to destroy. God has graciously granted, this is the way that the old Baptist confession describes being adopted by God. God has graciously granted that in and for the sake of his only son, Jesus Christ, all those that are justified shall be made partakers of the grace of adoption. On account of this, they are taken into the number of the children of God and enjoy their liberties and their privileges. They have God's name put upon them. They receive the spirit of adoption. They have access to the throne of grace with boldness. They're made able to cry, Abba, Father. They are pitied by God, protected by God, provided for by God, chastened by God, as by a father. They are never cast off. They are sealed for the day of redemption, and they inherit the promises of everlasting salvation as heirs. If you're in Christ, all of this is yours because what, of what God has provided in Jesus Christ. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, as the first and second born sons are mine. Now, as for me, verse 7 when I came from Padan, Rachel died. So here I'm going to renege on what I said before. There is one small glance back from Jacob. But even that, if we read it in context, it is in a greater picture of hope. When I came from Padan, Rachel died to my sorrow in the land of Canaan in the journey when there was still some distance to go to Ephrath, and I buried her there on the way to Ephrath. 
When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, Who are these? He's already said, Your sons are my sons. I'm adopting them. And now he has to ask the question, Who are these kids you're bringing in? I say kids, but right, they're over 17. We already know that. They were there before Jacob and the family moved. But this, part of this is an irony of circumstances because surely as Jacob asks the question, who are these? He hears in the back of his mind his father who had trouble seeing in his old age saying, who are you? When Jacob was there to deceive his father and to steal the birthright and the blessing. Jacob had taken advantage of his father in his old age as he struggled with poor vision. Jacob was actually usurping a blessing back then, but now here he is giving one. Who are these? He says. God Almighty. So connecting this section and seeing the parameters here, Jacob begins, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz and blessed me. And and then he closes that section. Rachel died to my sorrow and I buried her. The entirety of Jacob's life was lived between this tension of the wonderful and glorious promises of God on the one hand and the bitter reality of life's difficult struggle on the other. But is this not exactly where we find ourselves most of the time? I mean, we can read about what God says in his word and what he's accomplished for us and what he's promised for us as his children. Yet, bitter disappointment and grievous loss and severe challenges end up being part of our earthly journeys. Tears and suffering often mark our way, yet The sovereign God is able to bring fruit out of our pain and sorrow, to bring light out of the darkness that seems to cloud our lives. We see that that has happened in Jacob's life as he's lived in the midst of this tension of the wonderful promises, yet all of life's difficulties. But in the end, we see him still holding fast, clinging to his God and to the promises that have been made. Joseph answers his father, they're my sons whom God has given me. And Jacob asks, bring them so that I may bless them. Verse 11 is just a remarkable statement. I never, I mean, imagine the joy in Jacob's heart He's laying on his deathbed. So there's no joy in dying. But the reality of what he says here, I never expected to see your face again. And behold, God has let me see your children as well. Then Joseph took them from his knees and bowed with his face to the ground. Joseph, the ruler of Egypt, second in command in the entire nation, bows before his aged father, Acknowledging the superiority of God's covenant promises of which Jacob is obviously the mediator. Jacob blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. He's the God of the covenant, triune Jehovah, with whom my fathers walked. He's blessing him in this three-part blessing. God who has shepherded me, the, the God who has fed me all the way through life, who has led for and cared for and protected me. And thirdly, God, my Redeemer, who redeemed me from all evil, the one who rescued me and saved me. It's like he's covering all of the bases. The the God who is everything to me. May this God bless these boys. Here at the end of Jacob's life, he can say with great confidence, none of his pain has been wasted. None of his sorrow 
would prove fruitless. None of the trauma that he had been through was in vain. The good shepherd, God himself, had led him to green pastures, had led him through deep valleys of death, had provided all that he needed, and had rescued him out of desperate situations time and again. And then the second half of verse 16, and may my name live on in them, and the names of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and may they grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So remarkable blessings on the two sons of Joseph. But there's also covenant responsibilities that come for Ephraim and Manasseh. It's quite similar to church membership and the way that we approach it. There there are wonderful privileges to belonging to a local church family and there are blessings, but it comes with responsibility and obligations. We see this even in the covenant here that God is making with his people. Now, I mentioned this being a three-part blessing. We see that again showing up time and again. Number six, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. And even transitioning to the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 13, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. It's a Trinitarian blessing there from Paul to the church at Corinth. When Ephraim, pardon, when Jacob reaches out to bless the boys, you you heard in the reading, Joseph goes through the trouble of getting them in the right order. His father can't see very well. He's not attempting to trick his father the way that his father tricked his grandfather, and he takes them up with the one that deserves the blessing on his left so that it'll be on his father's right. But yet when Jacob reaches up to give the blessing, he crosses his hands. Joseph isn't happy about that. He says, not so. This is the firstborn. Jacob responds, I know. I know which one he is. And he'll be a people who will be great, but it's his younger brother who will be greater than he. The younger brother shall be greater. Joseph, like many before him, And like so many of us after him, had to learn that covenant blessings and God's grace are not obtained through natural birth or background, but are gifts, gracious gifts from a sovereign God. Our salvation as a people, your salvation as an individual is not because you belong to a special family or race or nation. It is solely based on God's free grace. That's what we see happening here. Joseph learning that. I give you one portion more than your brothers. Here's a confirmation of the covenant. I'm going to give you a piece of land, Joseph. You may remember, we've been in Genesis for quite some time, but the promise had to do with seed and soil or kid and country. Here's the soil or the country part of that. Part of the land of promise, I'm giving it to you. But not just that, the promise that you're, I want you to bring, verse 21, God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. You're coming back to it. It's a promise of the Exodus. The the initial Exodus that is recorded in the next book here in the Bible But it's the promise of the eventual exodus. The promise is not just for the people of God, for Joseph and his family. The promise is for us that we too will be led out of this world, that we will become inheritors of the earth, that we will live forever on the new earth in the midst of the new heavens one day. So that's the blessing of Joseph's sons. Picking up in chapter 49, the blessing of Leah's sons. Jacob summoned his sons and said, assemble yourselves that I may tell you what will befall you. So it's first things first. He gets the adopted children in. He makes it clear. He blesses them. And then he lines up the more familiar 12 sons and runs through them, not necessarily in birth order, but kind of separated by who birthed them, who the mom was. 
that I may tell you what will befall you in the days to come. So this is not some far-fetched idea that's just going to happen at some point, nor is it necessarily next week. Yet it is as sure as last week. It's guaranteed what, what Israel, what Jacob is saying to his sons, will come to pass. Let's look at a few of them, particularly the ones that are worth noting. Reuben. And he started off so well. You're my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. But the preeminence turns to defilement through an incestuous, adulterous encounter with Bilhah, his dad's mistress. Exalted hopes in this firstborn son shattered. Might and strength and dignity and power, all words that are used here to describe this firstborn son, wiped away because of an ungoverned impulse. Reuben, this is your blessing. You are unstable, uncontrolled, undisciplined in character, and you have forfeited your place of preeminence and privilege. You see, the sinful behavior that existed in his life did not match his original calling, and he fell from the preeminence, and that was his lasting legacy. In fact, in 1 Chronicles 5, this is the way that Reuben is described. Now, the sons of Reuben the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, so that he is not enrolled in the genealogy according to the birthright. High hopes dashed because of his sin. Verse 5, Simeon and Levi are brothers, or two of a kind, they're a pair, two peas in a pod. But their swords, of, are, their swords are implements of violence. That they're using the tools that God has given them for anarchy rather than justice. And it's noted here, and we looked at it in the earlier chapters, they lost their place in the family because of the violent cruelty against the Shechemites who had sinned wickedly towards their sister, but was, did not justify their response. Because of their slaughter, they will be scattered. But it's important to note that though they are cursed here in this form of blessing, God actually turns it into a blessing eventually for the Levites because they support Moses after the golden calf catastrophe. Moses says, after coming back down from the mountain, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered to him. He said to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, every man of you put his sword upon his thigh and go back and forth from gate to gate in the camp and kill every man his brother and every man his friend and every man his neighbor. They've done this before, but now they're doing it for the Lord. So the sons of Levi did as Moses instructed, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Then Moses said, dedicate yourselves to the Lord, for every man has been against his son and against his brother, in order that he may bestow a blessing upon you today. So it's ultimately not a blessing or an appropriate blessing is the way that the end of this chapter says it, but ultimately a curse that they're going to be scattered, but they will eventually receive a blessing when they do respond appropriately not taking things, taking matters into their own hands, but dealing with it according to God's justice. Verse 8, Judah. Now, though there's a bad start here with the first three boys, Judah makes a change. There's, there's a positive contrast here with him. And, and all in the midst of it as well, it's unavoidable with Judah, particularly at this point in the story, the messianic significance that continues to jump off of the page. In, in fact, Isaiah 53, 2, with talking about the Messiah who would come like a root out of parched ground, even reading about Jacob's sons up until this point, you have Reuben and Simeon and Levi, then there's some hope. There's a root out of parched ground 
in Judah, this promised one, this ruler of the nations that would bring about earthly paradise. He would give way to David on the one hand, the Davidic kingdom, but, but even better than that, to David's greater son. And he would, he would pave the way back to Canaan on the one hand, yet it's the entire earth. I will surely give the nations as your inheritance. It's, and, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. Or Jesus teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the gentle for they shall inherit the earth. For the Christian, it's, it's not just a tiny sliver of land over in the Middle East that has been promised to us, but the entire nations, all of the world has been promised to us. He's the God not of a small geopolitical area out there somewhere, but of everything, everywhere. He sits enthroned and rules. Psalm 78, God also rejected the tent of Joseph and he did not choose the tribe of Ephraim but chose the tribe of Judah. And here we see that being promised from Israel as he speaks this prophetic blessing over him. He'll be a kingly lion, a a ruler's scepter between his feet, a ruler's staff. He will be worthy of praise. And he has power and prosperity will come to him and through him. Even in the end of the scriptures, when we see John called up into heaven and the the throne room seen there, Revelation 5, 5, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. I mean, here from this man who is receiving a blessing from his father who has quite a terrible past that God has redeemed him from and he then will be chosen, has been chosen for the line of the Messiah, even his tribe being mentioned there in the courtroom of heaven. Prosperity will come from his rule. Verse 11, he ties his foal to the vine, his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washes his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. Vines and grapes and wine, a picture of plenty time and again throughout the scriptures. It's a return to paradise. Probably not unconnected with the reality that when Jesus began his public ministry, the first miracle recorded is him turning water into wine, about 150 gallons of water into wine. The promise was to Judah and Judah's line, and Jesus came through that line and put the picture on more full display. And then with Zebulun and Issachar, Leah's sons are completed, moving us to the third section, the blessing of the servants Sons, verses 16 through 21. Dan is the only one that I want to draw any significant attention to. He shall be a serpent in the way, a horned snake in the path that bites the horse's heels so that the rider falls backwards. The the coming king would heal all the effects of that fatal bite that had been inflicted by the old serpent, the devil. The last line there, verse 18 of Dan's section of blessing. For your salvation I wait, O Lord. Sin continues to run rampant. It continues to do its damage. And we wait for the Lord's salvation to come. And then Gad in verse 19, Asher in 20, Naphtali in 21 brings us to the final section. The blessing of Rachel's sons. Joseph, where everything has been geared towards and around, it's been the story of Joseph for quite some time here in the book of Genesis. A fruitful bow. He's fruitful. The, the, the depth of his character, the width of his influence, we've seen that with God sending him away to Egypt and elevating him from prison in Egypt to the Pharaoh's right hand. He will bring about earthly prosperity. Again, the fruitful bow by a spring, its branches running over a wall, it's overflowing, but not just prosperity. Verses 23 and 24, protection. The archers bitterly attacked him. They shot at him. They harassed him. 
He had enemies all throughout. That's how he ended up. It's, it's like the enemies are the ones that chased him in the path that God had set out for him. His brothers initially, Potiphar's wife eventually, the forgetful cupbearer leaving him a little bit longer. It's like everything was against Joseph, and yet he was experiencing this eternal protection of God from the shepherd, the stone of Israel there in the last line of verse 24. And not just earthly prosperity or eternal protection. Verse 25, in every possible way, blessing of in every feasible manner. Five times actually in those two verses. From the God of your Father who helps you and the Almighty who blesses you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb, the blessings of your Father have surpassed the blessings of my ancestors up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. May they be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of the one distinguished among his brothers. Joseph had been blessed and would continue to receive blessing. And then Benjamin, referred to as the ravenous wolf. And you can go back and study this and see that they all are given some animal that they are compared to, to, to bring into mind kind of the direction of their lives. And in 28, verses 28 and following, Jacob's end, finally. I began by telling you he was on his deathbed and now we're going to let him die. We're not going to actually bury him until next week probably, but we're going to at least let him die today. He comes to his end and he's gathered to his people. And we know to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. He has asked to be buried back in Canaan in that burial site that Abraham bought, the only thing they actually own as the people of God. He wants to be buried there, and they're going to do that. We'll see that in the first few verses of chapter 50. Jacob, on his deathbed, and even in his death, is showing his family the way out of Egypt back to the land of promise. It's a long time before they're going to trek that path. But Jacob finished well, pointing them in the way. He finished well. Are you on that kind of course? Are the decisions that you're making on an everyday basis, are they setting you up to finish well? Are you preparing to finish well? If you're waiting for the deathbed itself to finish well, it's just not going to happen. Finishing well for the child of God begins today. By us turning from our sin and trusting in him, serving God and his people. As long as we have an interest in God's covenant of grace, as long as we have a place with him and, and a name among his people, as long as we have the hope of heaven or the heavenly Canaan, we might say, then we can consider ourselves blessed in a very real way, more immensely blessed than any of Jacob's sons. With God in Christ. We've been promised full redemption and reconciliation and restitution. All our sins taken away and put on Christ in order that we might be robed in his righteousness, made sons and daughters, real actual sons with Christ being our elder brother. In fact, to, to close the service today as we come to the table, we're coming and proclaiming just that, that we are in Christ. We are identified with him. That by faith we are trusting only in his shed blood for the forgiveness of sins. We are saying before God and before others that we have repented of our sins and put all our trust in Jesus Christ identifying with him and with his people. And we're making a proclamation 
1 Corinthians 11.26, As often as you eat this bread, which represents Christ's broken body, and drink the cup representing his spilled blood, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're coming today in proclaiming the gospel one to another. That Jesus died, his body was broken for us, and his blood was shed for us. The blood of the new covenant for the remission of sins, for the forgiveness of guilt and shame. But the New Testament is clear there in 1 Corinthians that we aren't welcome to worship the Lord particularly in this manner in any way that we want or in a flippant way especially. The scriptures encourage us to examine ourselves, to examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith, to examine ourselves with regard to sin towards a brother or sister in Christ, to examine ourselves with regard to sin against God. When we take the Lord's Supper here in just a few moments, if you're in Christ Jesus, if you're a Christian and you have a meaningful relationship and are in good standing with the local church, that is, you're you're not somehow avoiding or trying to escape accountability or spiritual authority, then you're welcome to come and to partake of the bread and the cup representing our Lord's body and his blood. I mean, this is the way that Paul writes about it. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after the supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We're we're coming and doing what God has commanded us to do, taking the bread and taking the cup in remembrance of him, remembering who he is and what he's done for us through the gospel. If you're a Christian, you're welcome to come and partake. If you're not in Christ, the table is not for you. This is a proclamation for those who belong to Jesus. If you don't belong to him, then don't come to the table. With that said, if you don't belong to him, don't just sit back and mope in your sin or wish that the table was for you or wish that salvation was for you. Today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, as I said at the beginning of the service, Do not harden your hearts, but respond to him in faith. Not by coming to the table, taking of the body, taking of the bread and the cup will not be salvific for you, but Christ stands ready to save. And if you're a sinner, you qualify for salvation in him. So go to him. Go to someone that you trust here to talk to about him, about how you can be made right with him. But if you're not in Christ, then please refrain from the table and run to him. He who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner is guilty of the body and the blood of Jesus and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. It's worth us taking time to examine ourselves and to only come in order to proclaim the truth that the gospel has changed us. Abe is going to come so that he can play instrumentally while we take. John Allen is going to come and begin to set out the elements here. I'm going to pray, then after that, Abe will play and when the elements are finished here, feel free to come. Let's let's everyone file down the front of the building trying to think yeah I think that's right through the center not the front right I would be a good democratic candidate for a presidency some of you get that Um, come down the center aisle okay and attempt to split the table so some get and go this way some get and go that way and let's try to keep the traffic moving Um, however long it takes it takes Let's pray, and then we will partake together. 
Our Lord and God, we thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ, for the glorious covenant, the new covenant of blood. God, we thank you for the promises of the old covenant and how we see you bringing them to pass on the pages of your word week in and week out as we've trekked through Genesis together. God, we thank you that we can see even in the promises and the blessings that are there that you had a plan long ago that included sending your son to save sinners like us. God, we thank you for salvation that is in Jesus. We pray, God, that you would continue saving souls in our midst even this morning. For those who don't know you, God, stretch out your arm of salvation and rescue them as brands from the burning. God, for those of us that you have plucked out of the miry clay and put our feet on the rock that is Christ, we praise you and thank you for the privilege of coming to the table and partaking of the bread and the cup representing your body and blood. God, we thank you that you gave up your son for us, that you poured out the wrath that was due us on him and that he absorbed it, quenched it all, that we might be robed in his eternal righteousness. God, we pray that you would grant us mercy and grace during this time to worship you as we proclaim your son's death until he comes again. In Christ's name, amen.